Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Jamie. I'm uh, honored to be here. Um, but I must say I am also a bit intimidated looking out at this crowd. You see, I've heard this meeting referred to as a 2,000-person family reunion, uh, a most impressive family reunion. Consider Jamie, uh, whose company, as I learned from their website, purchases 20 million pounds of local produce each year and growing, and in the last few years has diverted hundreds of thousands of pounds of paper and plastic waste from landfills. In this room are no, no, no less than four CSAs that each have at least 2,000 members, uh, or witness the devotion of longtime PASA members that you'll see strolling through the silent auction. Uh, I was particularly taken by the hand-sewn doll and shawl offered up by knitter and felter Sheila Colston as well as the basket generously and meticulously put together by the Bernhardts of Indian Orchard, including dried apples, holly greens sent to your home, and a staycation at their farm. I've been to the NOFA New York conference a number of times, and I have never witnessed people rock out the way folks did over there <laughs> last night <laughs> to Hoots and Helmuth. Yesterday, I saw a little girl sit down to give a testimonial reflection, and she just gushed with enthusiasm, talking about all the people she met, all the things she learned, all the good ideas she had. It turns out this was her first PASA conference, and she'd only been here a few hours before she gave that <laughs> reflection. As luck would have it, while I was waiting for my train at Penn Station in New York, I saw a woman in the corner, a young woman in the corner with dust on her boots, sitting quietly and flipping through a seed catalog. Uh, she was from Queens, New York, and it turned out she was also on her way to this conference. She's not a farmer, her parents are not a farmer, but she decided that she wanted to take over management of their community garden plot, plot in Queens, and so her parents paid for her to come to this conference. And how about those posters on the wall with quotes from Kim that we've heard about? Now, Kim is a humble guy, but that's some, some profound stuff that he's saying. Uh, I want to write all of them down in a book and keep it by my bed for inspiration at night. Um, yes, <laughs> this is an impressive group. And uh, since this is my first time in Happy Valley, I'm feeling like a bit of an outsider. So uh, I thought it was only fitting to share some of my own history uh, and what I was doing 20 years ago, which happened to coincide with my own first forays into farming. <clears throat> Now, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know it at first glance, but this is me at the student-run farm that I helped to found at Stanford University. On the left, I'm holding a mustard plant, uh, part of an a exercise for us to document our per pernicious weeds. Uh, the shot on the right is me holding a, a U-bar that I cut and welded uh, as part of a civil engineering class that I needed to graduate. Um, now, grow, growing up in New York City, my intention with starting this farm was obviously to get my hands dirty. Uh, this was a campus, it's worth noting, that had offered no classes in farming or gardening or food for that matter. Uh, I remember encountering a fair bit of what you might consider short-sighted thinking on agriculture. I recall one economics course where the professor argued adamantly in trying to explain the concept of comparative advantage that if Mexico can buy corn on the world market cheaper than it can grow it, then there was no reason for Mexico to grow corn. Among the first crops that we planted at the farm was asparagus. Now, I'm a big fan of asparagus, and years later I would choose to feature a confident green spear on the inaugural issue of Edible East End, uh, partly because it's among the first crops that welcome us into spring in just a couple short months, but also because asparagus is a good metaphor uh, for resilience and perseverance, uh, two elements that we will hear lots about over the next couple days. Uh, we planted asparagus at the farm in a long trench that we carefully double dug and filled with some beautiful composted manure from the university stables. And it did quite well, which was either dumb luck, uh, since I'd never planted asparagus before, or some foresight that we had to quickly get into the ground berry canes and fruit trees and other woody perennials that would in a short while become so big and so fat that no future university president could possibly cut them down without incurring the wrath of student protests. 
Uh, part of what also motiv- motivated me to plant this farm was a lecture from the ecologist Paul Ehrlich, where he argued that agriculture was the single biggest way in which Uh, humanity touched the planet. And he wasn't exaggerating. As we've heard, uh, farming's impact is massive. It occupies about 40% of the Earth's land mass, uses 75% of all the fresh water we use, and growing, processing, shipping, and eating food generates about 33% of our greenhouse gas emissions. 20 years after that Ehrlich lecture, if anything, that impact has grown. And after hearing dire predictions of how climate change will disrupt the temperature and rainfall patterns that all of us depend on, it's troubling that climate scientists have shifted from using the future tense to speaking in the present. They're already documenting 5 to 10 percent yield losses as a result of warmer temperatures and less predictable rainfall in Asia, in Africa, and here in the Americas. And as, this, and as if that weren't enough, uh, most recently the power of the world's financial sector has emerged as a new threat to our food system. A new breed of speculators are dabbling in commodity trading, large international land purchases, and other gambles that have provoked great instability in food prices. Global food price spikes are no longer an occasional phenomenon. They are at a new plateau, not unlike oil prices, with no sign of prices going down. Now, I was only at that farm for one year, and I'm excited to report that even though I've had minimal contact with the farmers who came after me, uh, it remains. This is a shot of the farm today. Uh, Where there was once a three-acre neglected patch of grass, There are marvelous raised beds, an orchard of fruit trees, big patches of berries, and an impressive herb garden, not to mention a uh, a wood-fired stove where there are weekly pizza-making parties. There are no fewer than four on-farm courses offered to hundreds of students each season. The farm sells to on-campus eateries and makes regular donations to the local food pantry. And the farm inspired a sustainable food policy for the campus that included regional buying, increased composting, and divesting university funds from agribusiness firms like PepsiCo. Perhaps most impressive, the farm, remains, the, the, <laughs> the farm remains one of the last pieces of open space on a campus that has built up dramatically in the last two decades. Now, I know there is a 180-acre farm not far from here at Dickinson College, so a three-acre farm at Stanford University is really not that impressive. Um, but a radical shift in thinking about food on a major university campus is a sign, in my opinion. And for the next uh, 30 minutes or so, if you'll bear with me, I'm going to take you from northern California to halfway across the globe in Africa before coming back here again to my home farm community in New York to give you a sense that there is a profound and hopeful shift underway in how people, farmers and non-farmers alike, are thinking about food. It's a shift that will benefit your bottom line and will mean more people sharing the values, the same values that we share here in this room. This is someone you might recognize. Um, A few years ago, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation contacted me to help organize a meeting of environmental and agriculture groups in Washington, D.C. The foundation had invested billions to try to prevent and eradicate polio, malaria, HIV, AIDS, and other diseases that cripple and kill hundreds of millions of people around the world. But in a radical move, the foundation felt its work was failing, and they wanted to shift their attention to agriculture, realizing that many of the poorest people in the world live on farms. And if you want to improve their lives and their health, you might instead focus on how they make their living. In fact, the Gates Foundation has quickly become among the largest funders of agricultural research in the world, and it wanted advice from the sustainable agriculture community on what to invest in. Now, the foundation understood what an intractable intractable problem they were confronting. Uh, The planet produces more food than ever before, while at the same time, nearly one out of six members of the human family goes hungry. 
So over the next couple of years, I was part of a team of researchers who traveled across Africa, the region of the world where hunger is most entrenched, speaking to farmers and crop scientists and environmentalists and others looking for innovations that could help reduce hunger and poverty. We visited nearly 400 projects in 30 countries, and at the end, we suggested that the foundation focus on uh, focus its attention on four major areas of what we considered heavily neglected innovations that could prove very effective. First, we told the foundation to make better use of the food already produced. We constantly hear projections that the world's going to need to double food production in the coming decades. But our money will be better spent cutting down on food waste which can total an astonishing 25 to 50 percent of the harvest, whether you're talking about Africa or the United States. It's really a staggering figure considering how much we invest in boosting production in the first place. Food waste is an insidious problem since it happens throughout the entire food chain. Part of the loss happens on the farm, part of it happens in post-harvest storage, part in shipping, part in selling, and then finally part at the, farm, uh, at the home. But what we found were innovations at every level of the chain that reduced this waste and that were often simple and inexpensive. Consider this triple-layer bag developed by Purdue University for protecting cow peas from pests. The bag costs just $2 and can increase a cow pea farmer's incomes by $150 per year. This is in a region of the world where the average income is only a few hundred dollars a year. In West Africa alone, improved storage of cow peas would be worth $255 million each year to some of the poorest farmers in the world. <clears throat> Second, we advised the foundation to focus on kids, and this sort of surprised them, specifically feeding kids in school, not unlike the universal breakfast programs and lunch programs that are provided in many of our nation's school districts. For instance, uh, <clears throat> For instance, the Homegrown School Feeding Program, which is a project of the World Food Program, now includes a dozen nations in Africa alone. These programs have proven easy to scale up and can save households as much as 10% of their budget. Even better, these programs are based entirely on crops grown and processed locally. Look, look at these numbers. In Mali, 100,000 kids are participating. In Sudan, 1.2 million. 2 million children in Nigeria. This is still considered a pilot program. In Kenya, where 1.2 million children currently participate in the program, expanding the program to cover all children would boost the annual incomes of 175,000 farmers by around $50 each. Expanding these programs to cover 50 million children across Africa, the estimated number that are hungry, would mean billions of additional dollars for African economies. Third, the foundation should plan for more farmers in cities. Africa is urbanizing faster than the rest of the world, with 14 million people moving to cities each year. This is a migration second only to the massive shift that's happening in China's cities. This shift will strain urban infrastructure and pressure farmland in and around cities, but it's estimated that by 2020, 40 million Africans will depend for their nourishment and income on farming in cities. Now, there's no shortage of models for very productive and profitable urban farms, from the rooftops of Brooklyn, New York, to Greensboro Farm in Philadelphia. Uh, this image is from Kibera, which is the largest slum in Nairobi, Kenya, where 150,000 women uh, have, are raising vegetables in small gardens, including in sacks filled with earth. When food prices recently spiked in Kenya, these families had a buffer. Cities that want to feed themselves better, we suggested, will need to make massive investments in food infrastructure, in agricultural extension, in processing facilities, in slaughterhouses, in public markets, and food distribution centers. Fourth, uh, create incentives and programs to pay farmers for storing carbon in their soils and on their land. I love this slide because you don't know uh, if it's a forest or a farm. And in fact, it's both. Uh, this is a shot from Kenya, and it shows a type of indigenous acacia tree called Phyderbia that farmers planted in between rows of corn and other crops. It fixes nitrogen, so where farmers can't afford fertilizer, the trees can help double or triple uh, the yields of a subsequent crop. The leaves and branches can be used as animal feed and fuel, and the trees can help buffer farms against extreme heat 
and drought. This is what it looks like after two decades. And fields like this are taking root across East Africa in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. Millions of African farmers are fertilizing their soils by planting trees. Even better, by planting trees among crops, stewarding nearby forests, and keeping their soils planted for more of the year, African farmers can remove 50 billion tons of carbon from the atmosphere over the next few decades. To put that in perspective, that 50 billion tons of carbon is like eliminating an entire year's worth of all of our greenhouse gas emissions. And this would be a generous contribution from a region that currently produces a tiny fraction of those emissions. We found roughly 75 projects like this in 22 countries across Africa already in the works compensating farmers for providing these climate healing services. Now, uh, these weren't the typical examples we think of for reducing hunger. They wouldn't be the large-scale, one-size-fits-all solutions of the Green Revolution, the wonder rice that works from China to India to West Africa. Instead, what we saw working were principles for how to manage the land better and how to manage our food system better. And yet, in another shift in thinking about food and agriculture, donors like the Gates Foundation are starting to think beyond what's been tried before, since what's been tried before hasn't worked. It hasn't worked in those areas where hunger is worse, and because a different approach could actually be more affordable, more long-lasting, especially in the diverse settings and circumstances that the future demands. A Gates colleague told me proudly, uh, but also in confidence, that the foundation would in 10 years be the biggest investor in organic farming research. <clears throat> Which was either an indication of how serious their interest is in this area uh, or the fact that currently there's literally no investment in low-cost ways <laughs> to boost soil fertility, to make better use of scarce water, Uh, and on solutions that exist beyond the farm and all along the food chain. So any investment they make would be relatively huge. It is becoming clear, though, to the Gates Foundation and others that after moving in the direction of making our crop fields and our livestock herds and our supermarket shelves more and more homogenous with little signature of place and little touch of the human hand, that reducing vulnerability, not just in poor and hungry communities, but all throughout the food chain, will require re-injecting diversity at all links. Now, tapping this diversity really has tremendous potential, partly because it's been so neglected by crop breeders and by farmers. Another important finding from our research in Africa was that while indigenous grains like millet or cowpea often don't yield as much as corn or wheat in a good year, in a bad year they are competitive. And this is with just a fraction of the attention of breeders. In fact, it's estimated that breeding work on these minor neglected grains and a wide range of indigenous vegetables from okra to pigeon pea to various braising greens has a 400% return on investment compared to just a few percent return on breeding in the most common crops. Heifer International, the anti-hunger group that gifts cows, goats, poultry, and other farm animals, isn't just diversifying the breeds it offers. It's beginning to catalog and invest in different kinds of indigenous fodder and grasses that contribute biological diversity to the landscape and ensure a more stable supply of local food. And it is worth noting that one of the largest grants that the Gates Foundation made recently was to Heifer International. (laughs) This photo is from a a, a seed-saving festival put on in Italy by Slow Food. And this was a woman who who claimed that she had a wheat that was passed down to her uh, through her family from Roman times. Uh, These same scientists who are starting to show us that crops around the world are suffering from warmer and more erratic weather patterns are pleading with us to to preserve as much of our crop diversity as possible, since they know that it's this very diversity that holds the plants that can cope with weather extremes. In the test fields and greenhouses where they can replicate uh, conditions of, of, of a changed climate, the plots that do the best are those that are planted with a diversity of plants, diversity of breeds within one species, and a diversity of plants across the board. Not all may thrive in a particular particularly hot or dry year, but something will do better. 
Diversity helps us thrive. Yes, in our diets, it's the basis of good health. In our, in our communities, it's often the basis of economic stability. Uh, consider the example of Yellow Springs Farm in Chester Springs, Pennsylvania, which you might have heard of. Uh, the farm started out as a native plant's nursery and added a cheese-making operation. And then to diversify beyond this, uh, they, started, uh, they started a cheese CSA, uh, a CSA that offered a regular monthly shipment uh, or pickup of the cheeses that, that they made. Uh, it was a hedge against all the other ventures that they had against the farm, but it also began to broaden the knowledge base of cheese making in their area. Or uh, think about the work of Organic Valley. Uh, this is the largest farmer-owned uh, dairy cooperative in the country, uh, and they are a national firm, and they get to take advantage of the economies of scale of being a national firm. But they have realized that it's important to invest in regional diversity and regional processing capacity. Uh, this is an ad from their uh, New York Fresh line of milk. This is milk raised by New York farmers, processed and bottled in New York, and sold exclusively in New York. And they have rolled out these regional brands with all the regional infrastructure that's required in California, in Texas, and in other major markets. They realize that their customers want to see this diversity in the food chain, and they'll support more than just farmers if they can provide that. Or have you seen the workshops offered on heritage grains in the schedule today and tomorrow? This is a project run by a Grow NYC and the Green Markets in New York. Uh, the, 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 the director of this project, June Russell, was saying to me that when they first started it, she didn't know why it was such a big deal. You know, muffins made with heritage grain, who cares? Um, but, uh, but, but what she realized was that that muffin made with a more diverse set of grains, uh, represented additional cover crops that farmers could work into their mix, represented a future for grain processing capacity in the region, and diversis diversified the diet of everyone who would buy those grains, not just consumers, but chefs and distillers and brewers who were looking for barley and oats and other grains. I was recently with uh, Cheryl Rogowski, a vegetable farmer in Organic County, New York, who won a MacArthur Genius Grant a few years ago for helping to figure out how rural communities in her area could thrive. Like many farms in the Hudson Valley, Rogowski's farm was hit hard by heavy flooding uh, this past summer during Hurricane Irene. This is actually from a neighboring farm, uh, John Smith's farm. Um, much of Rogowski's farm, like this one, was under eight feet of water for weeks. After cleaning up and digging out, Rogowski's attention turned to what she called weather management. She took the obvious steps. She re relocated her greenhouses and other structures from low-lying areas to the highest ground. But she's also redoubling her efforts to extend her growing season, assuming partly that winters will be less severe. And she's also doing whatever she can to build the supply of vegetables she can sell year-round. She's shifting away from crops that are most temperature-sensitive. To hear Cheryl and other growers talk about this recent flooding, which took 80% of the crop on some farms, it's become less a story of loss and destruction and more a story of resilience and a wake-up call that diversity on the farm will make it more robust for future flooding and any other threats. If diversity helps us thrive, then a lack of it can make us sick. <clears throat> Think of the sometimes mysterious rise in food allergies in this country and elsewhere, which seems to be partly a result of the fact that we can track and diagnose them better, but also a result of the fact that our food is different today than it used to be. One of the fastest growing allergies worldwide is uh, gluten intolerance, uh, which has prompted bakers and brewers to come out with gluten-free breads and pastries and beers made without wheat. Interestingly enough, the latest research on gluten allergies is coming from Italy, where more and more people are experiencing digestive symptoms on the traditional diet of bread and pasta and other wheat staples. And here is what they're finding. First, the wheat of today is different than the wheat of yesteryear. As crop breeders have selected for wheat with a higher yield, more responsiveness to fertilizer, and certain traits desired by industrial bakers, the nutritional the nutritional composition of our wheat has changed. Second, while a given loaf of bread was traditionally made with many grains, from barley to oats to millet to wheat, our breads today are less diverse. 
That is, they are often 100% wheat flour. And our methods of making bread and other wheat products have also become less diverse and much more rapid. We've sped them up. It turns out fermented breads or traditional sourdoughs have a tiny fraction of the gluten allergen compared to their industrial counterparts. The process of fermentation breaks down the allergen and transforms it, whereas factory-made wonder-style bread does virtually nothing to make the wheat more digestible. Now, as you consider whether you're going to have bread with your lunch today, um, (laughs) it would be a good time to take stock of where we've come so far uh, by pointing to a farm at Stanford University, uh, the funding decisions of the Gates Foundation, and the latest thinking on food allergies. I've suggested that more and more people realize that the agriculture of yesterday isn't going to be the agriculture of tomorrow. And I hope you're starting to see, as I do, some of the shared principles that must be part of the future of farming if it's going to thrive. Focusing on kids, injecting diversity, cutting waste at all levels of the food chain. You might also notice that not all of the solutions to our agricultural problems will come on the farm. And this might be surprising in saying this to a room full of farmers. Uh, Believe me, farmers will play a big role in saving the world. There's no question. Uh, But another important shift in the agricultural discussion is that farmers cannot do it alone and won't do it alone. Because today, farmers need allies more than ever before. Not just because we're all captive to what the erratic weather brings, to changes in fuel and fertilizer prices, and the whims of regulators and policymakers, but because farmers are a minority. Yes, you heard me right. Uh, As this graph shows, farmers make up just a couple percent of our population. We are not an agricultural nation anymore. I would argue that farmers might be our nation's most important minority because food is emerging as the only solution to so many of our worst problems. It's farmers who can help reduce greenhouse gas emissions by locking carbon in their soils. It's farmers who can jumpstart small-town economies with new innovative products and crops and ventures. It's farmers who will help us improve our health and reduce health care costs. But it's that other share of the population that can really make this happen. And the future of farmers will depend more and more on creative alliances with everybody else. So I want to invite you all to shift in your seats a little bit and prepare for one more journey. And since my bread and butter is chronicling my local food community, uh, let me share some stories from the place where I live, Uh, some stories that fill me with hope for the future of farming, not just in my area, but everywhere. Lying about 70 miles east of New York City, the east end of Long Island is one of the oldest farming and fishing areas in the nation, uh, with some farm families counting back 15 generations and some fishing families whose claim on a given clamming spot extends back to a 17th century grant from King George of England. Many local historians have noted that from the sky, Long Island looks like a fish, uh, with its head touching New York City in the west and its forked tail reaching into the ocean. I live on the south fork, the southernmost fork, right there near the end. This bit of land was created by our last uh, process of glaciation that pushed up some incredible soil, Bridgehampton loam, which is uh, what we farm uh, in this area. And I've already said that the history of modern agriculture sometimes reads like a mass extinction event, small farms gobbled by large ones, crop varieties narrowed and lost, real choices limited. But to live and eat on the East End today is like watching that process unfold in reverse. Just this year, no fewer than three farms added substantial acreage in hops. The expanding fields have been commissioned by local breweries like the Southampton Public House and the Greenport Harbor Beer Company to meet the demands of a blooming beer culture. All the way down the beer chain are bars like The Good Life in Massapequa, whose awesome selection of 24 tap lines includes Uh, those mostly hooked up to New York-made kegs. There are at least three efforts to create local seed banks, several new farm distilleries, several new dairies selling raw milk, butter, and cheese, including one in this audience, and no fewer than three companies making sea salt from the Atlantic Ocean and the surrounding bays. This past fall, I was speaking to one of those innovative East End farmers, David Falkowski, 
David, who has attended this conference more than once, uh, is part of the new generation of farmers in my area. He comes from a farming family that's been growing potatoes and cauliflower and other row crops since the Polish migration of the 1840s. David is known as the mushroom man, uh, partly for the shiitake and oyster mushrooms he grows. Even more interesting, over the last eight years, David has shifted from selling his crop to restaurants and other wholesale customers to selling it almost entirely at farmer's markets and through his farm stand. In fact, he claims this shift saved his farm. And he wants to shift even further to selling his crops to just 100 or 200 families through a CSA. It's a shared burden, he said, of CSAs. It's economically constant. It's not going to fluctuate with weather. It's like cash on the barrel. It's like cash on the barrel. There is a shared burden between farmer and eater, and this is another big idea that I want to leave you with. CSAs and farmers markets are not going to work for everyone in this room, but they do offer a glimpse of the sort of harmonious, prosperous, and delicious collaborations that can benefit all growers. So we've heard of CSAs, uh, but have you heard of wine clubs? which nearly all the 50-some-odd wineries on Long Island have launched. It's a way to guarantee some steady income, to hedge against poor harvest, and to begin to build an appreciation of the distinctive character of our region's wines. As a start, members get regular shipments of wine, but they might also get to stomp grapes or taste wines in the cellar before they are released to the public. And they begin to feel a vested interest in the success of that winery business. Have the horticulturalists in this room considered a plant of the month club? Have the fruit growers considered a weekly or monthly fruit box? There's a honey CSA in my town that has a waiting list. People are craving a regular reminder that they are supporting their farmer. Not all of these good ideas are going to come from farmers. Many of them will come from citizens who want to help farmers. Consider some new collaborations that have emerged in my area between food pantries and farmers. A few months ago, a neighbor and friend who raises bees and chickens and keeps a home garden had a seasonal epiphany. The number of farmers visiting local food, pa- the, rather, the number of families Visiting local food pantries swells in winter, just as many nearby farmers have lost their main roadside customers. So working with the local land trust, she quickly raised $15,000 in small and large donations, bought crops from a group of local farmers, and delivered it to local pantries. Pantry visitors got a wider selection of fresh produce. Farmers got a new customer. Now, these were donations that would have likely been made uh, anyway, but now they were earmarked for local agriculture. Even local government is getting in on the game. Uh, Tapping into unused resources and unsuspecting generosity was also the goal of town officials throughout my region uh, who added refrigerated coolers at various strategic points to make it easier for hunters to drop off excess deer meat and for people in need to pick it up. This is all creative thinking, but it's also ways for us all to carry the shared burden, no matter where we are in the food chain. And anyone who has spent a small fortune fencing out deer, which I imagine some people in this room have, um, knows we'd do well to encourage a local taste for venison. I mean, we're not, we're not talking necessarily about complete self-sufficiency. There's always going to be room on the table for exotic flavors. But it just makes sense that what we grow in our regions should be on the table in our regions. Sometimes the shared burden means enlisting non-farmers to help with the work of food production. How about the SPAT program uh, run by Cornell University to enlist citizen oyster gardeners to help replenish the wild oyster, clam, and scallop beds of the Peconic Bay? Uh, SPAT stands for South Hold Project on Aquaculture Training, and SPAT is also the term for baby shellfish. Anyone can join this program. Uh, Members get trained in basic aquaculture. They get set up with baby oysters, cages to keep them in, and even a place on the waterfront where you get to keep your cages. It's the largest community aquaculture program in the country, and it regularly seeds the bays with millions of baby shellfish. And this means more shellfish for bay men and bay women to harvest over the long term. 
In full disclosure, I am a member of this program. I got into it because, as, as a perk, uh, members get to keep half of what they raise for their own consumption, uh, returning the other half to the bays. And as you might imagine, uh, come harvest in the fall and winter, we members have the serious oyster hookup. <clears throat> Many of us invite our friends, uh, many of us who are more generous, invite our friends and neighbors uh, at, to dine on fried oysters and oyster chowder and oyster po'boys po or to slurp them up raw. That's what you like to do. And when neighbors learn that someone is growing oysters nearby, they are inspired to plant their own garden and learn more about the program. That's why in just the last few years, the program has grown to include nearly 300 gardeners around the Peconic Bay. I like to think of each of these little blue dots like underwater mollusk militias, <laughs> fighting pollution along the coast. Even better, this program on Long Island has inspired similar programs in Florida, in the Puget Sound, in Seattle, and, uh, and in Japan, at a time when local governments and environmental groups are struggling to tackle coastal pollution, which is exactly what healthy shellfish populations help us do. Like our farm fields, our waterfront is not just the burden of the men and women who work on it, but also the people who live near it. A few years back, when the governor of New York was deciding whether or not to allow the construction of a natural gas platform in the Long Island Sound, the Long Island Farm Bureau came out against it. This was largely in solidarity with the, sh the fishing and fish farming members. This is the shared burden. We need to heat our homes, yes, but not at the expense of our oyster beds. We may not have a waterfront around here, but something very similar is happening with community seed saving and backyard beekeeping. Much more powerful than farmers keeping bees or saving seeds is when, is when literally millions of non-farmers keep bees and save seeds. It adds to the collective whole in a way that farmers can't necessarily do themselves. Think of the timely debate about the costs and consequences of allowing fracking in the region and elsewhere around the nation. At least in my state of New York, the anti-fracking movement isn't being led so much by farmers but by well-intentioned friends of farmers, land trusts, watershed protection groups, school children. A coalition of thousands of New York City chefs and restaurant workers have banded together under the Chefs for the Marcellus campaign arguing to the governor that regardless of the short-term benefits, fracking will endanger the market for Empire State produce in New York City and beyond. And, and they're not the only ones. Uh, the celebrated Omagang Brewery is threatening to pull up roots and leave Cooperstown. The Park Slope Food Co-op, which has 100,000 members, has organized a letter-writing campaign noting that it will stop buying produce from the region. Farmers will not do it alone, and they can't, because problems like fracking or the collapse of bee colonies are too big for just farmers to worry about. This is the shared burden but it's also community-supported agriculture at the next level. Eating is an agricultural act, as Wendell Berry has wisely said. But it goes well beyond that, because the good work that eaters can do hopefully goes well beyond just what they put in their mouths. Perhaps the most exciting example of the shared burden, and one that is near and dear to my heart, is the domino effect of edible schoolyards in my area. A few years ago, a school in one town put in a greenhouse and a garden and a teaching kitchen. Parents and school nurses and students at neighboring schools heard about it, and they got jealous. And before you knew it, every school district on the East End had its own edible schoolyard and was competing with its neighbors to work as much local produce into the cafeteria as possible. At last count, 16 schools on the East End now have a garden, greenhouse, or other project to get students into the farm field and the kitchen. And this is a little outdated. There are red dots all over the place now. Now, I've heard this is the only agricultural conference in the state that requires child care, <clears throat> and that PASA has a very strong youth program, so it's worth dwelling on this a bit. We know that good eating habits start at home, but particularly at a time when our nation faces an unprecedented obesity epidemic among children, wouldn't it be great 
if kids came home from school demanding healthy food and knowing how to cook it? Well, I agree. I know that I would appreciate it. I've actually been writing a series called Eating with Cleo about all the anxieties I feel as a parent when trying to instill in my four-year-old daughter good eating habits. Yes, this is her. She's very cute. (laughs) This is the time when you're all supposed to go, aww. (laughs) And it's awfully fun to see her picking berries, weeding the garden, helping snap the ends off of green beans, baking cookies. As more of our local schools realize a basic knowledge of kitchen and garden chores is as important as anything our kids learn in school. And perhaps it even prepares our children to be that much better eaters than we are uh, of tomorrow than we are today. Programs like farm to, farm to Cafeteria and Farm to School programs have cropped up in every major school district in the country, and you might have heard that the USDA just appointed for the first time a, a, a coordinator, a national coordinator of Farm to School programs. This just happened yesterday, and it's a very good sign. It's actually the woman who... who <clears throat> It's the the woman who used to publish Edible Portland, a sister magazine of ours. And the reason that anti-hunger groups and nutrition groups focus on schools is they know that feeding uh, kids in schools is effective. The kids are a captive audience, and it's another incentive for families to make sure their kids attend school. Kids gain food literacy and rural communities gain a new market. The Chicago Public School District, the third largest in the nation, recently contracted with several Midwestern uh, poultry growers for several million pounds of antibiotic-free chicken. Whole Foods... Whole Foods Market, one of the largest buyers of antibiotic-free meat in the country, actually helped broker the deal and make the introduction. And it sounds like this purchase is provoking many poultry farms in the region to go antibiotic-free because they're now interested in getting that contract. But it gets even more personal than feeding our kids. Uh, Even though I'm not a farmer, as a journalist and storyteller, I hope that I do my part. Uh, Edible East End, uh, the magazine I edit, is part of a national network of magazines with a mission to chronicle their local food and drink community. The network started in 2002 in Ojai, California, and it now includes 70 magazines from coast to coast. It's a concept that seems to work everywhere, in small towns and big cities, on the coasts and in the heartland, in red states and blue states. Edible magazines are locally owned, locally published, locally distributed, and supported almost entirely by local advertising, not unlike the, ju- the, the, the jars of jam and the cheeses and the other delectables uh, from, from the plain community that I brought a bag uh, to, to fill up and towed home to, to my family. And in contrast to the Food Network that might treat eating as a spectator's sport, we hope to entice and coax and convince our readers to step up to the plate, literally, and to play their role in the shared burden. I think of this testimonial from the Edible Austin reader you see here. Our readers, like this person from Texas, want to be inspired to take action. And we want them to be. All of the stories, uh, all of our stories include concrete people and places that our readers can go and touch. Farms they can visit in a day's drive, products they can support and buy at local shops, local food politics initiatives that they can get behind. When we wrote about rooftop beekeeping in the inaugural issue of Edible Manhattan, it wasn't just to chronicle the very sweet honey that was being raised on top of skyscrapers. It was to convince our readers that the New York City law making urban beekeeping illegal had to change and pointing them towards the groups and politicians that were working for that change. The law changed not half a year after we published this article, I'm happy to report. We're carrying our part of the burden by inspiring our readers to change the world around them through what they eat and what they drink. 
<clears throat> Speaking of drinking, because we probably all need a drink right about now, um, <clears throat> you wouldn't think that people saddling up to cocktail bars had much to do with supporting agriculture, but they are doing their part too. Like most of what we put in our mouths, the liquor business in this country is highly concentrated with just a few big brands and companies dominating the market. But the fastest growing segment of the American liquor business is what are called premium spirits, many of which are small batch and artisanal. Pennsylvania, as you might know, is near the forefront of this, of this trend. Here are two local brands that you might recognize. Uh, Oregon is actually the, nat the national leader in licensed micro distilleries, with New York a uh, close second, I'm proud to say. Uh, what's pushing the industry in these states are laws that make it easy for farms to set up distilleries as well as very enlightened laws like the ones they just passed in New York and that I hope will spread throughout the country that require beer and spirits producers in the state to use, uh, that, that the majority of the grain or other feedstock for those beer and spirits come from within the state. The ultimate demand, though, the ultimate purchase, the ultimate consumption of this product is coming from drinkers who care as much about the origins of the rye in their whiskey and the apples in their hard cider as they do about the beef in their burgers. We will have more unlikely allies than ever before, unlikely allies like this. And it's easy to forget this. As a movement, it feels like often we're in a place of being defensive. Uh, we feel we've got to rail against Monsanto. We've got to defend organic and sustainable principles and benefits from those who would deny them. Uh, but here's what I predict. That campaign, that $30 million campaign that we heard about earlier, is, is going to be a massive flop. It's going to be a massive failure. And here's why. Because <clears throat> that $30 million campaign that unfortunately is supported by some of our own dollars uh, is going to be a massive flop because it's pushing against a wave, a giant wave of people, more people than ever before, who understand the basic principles of what makes some food good and some food not so good. The excellent writing of Michael Pollan has helped bring many people into the fold, but consider how it has evolved from the problems-focused omnivore's dilemma to the stripped-down, illustrated version of food rules designed to deliver much of the same information but to a much larger audience. Or think about Slow Food USA's very successful recent $5 campaign where they took back control of the value meal language from McDonald's and inspired 30,000 Americans to send images of good, inexpensive meals that they had made from scratch at home. More and more, the solutions are accessible to all of us. Which brings me to that massive, scary piece of legislation that comes up for discussion every five years and that we might all be sick of talking about. I'll admit I'm sick of it because in the four farm bill cycles that I've watched, nothing seems to change. But here's what I think is different now. Most of the farm bill debate usually focuses on crop payments, those well-intentioned subsidies that discourage farmers from trying new crops and disproportionately benefit the largest growers. But did you know that the largest chunk of money in the Farm Bill actually isn't crop payments, but food assistance programs? Those programs represent two out of every three Farm Bill dollars, about $60 billion a year. Now, commodity payments seem to be the most stubborn, most heavily lobbied aspect of the Farm Bill, so maybe we should turn our attention to the other side of the food chain. There are now efforts in pretty much every state to steer that food assistance money towards farmers' markets, CSAs, and buying direct from farmers to supply food assistance. I have it on good intelligence from someone high up at the New York State Department of Agriculture that there is language being inserted into this 2012 Farm Bill that will make it that much easier for electronic benefits transfer, EBT, to be used at farmers' markets throughout the country. And it's changes like that that ultimately might create more business for farmers than any changes we might see in crop, in crop payments. 
More and more people are carving out time in their lives for food and drink experiences, for cooking with their families, for visiting nearby farms, for asking questions about their food. That is why that $30 million campaign will fail. I was speaking with uh, Mary Kretschmann, uh, a, a lifelong PASA member, uh, and she told me that 40 years ago, uh, when she started attending Pennsylvania Vegetable Grower Association meetings and mentioning the word organic, that people laughed at her, that she was ignored. When they would go around the table in a room and introduce everyone, they would skip over her, and she didn't even know how to react. Uh, she said that, that most of those people uh, that, that laughed at her are no longer in business today, and the people who are would never laugh uh, when she mentioned the word organic. In fact, many of them are now coming to her for advice. So things have changed. Now, is this going to be enough? Definitely not. Uh, we often hear talk of the ag of the middle, the great majority of farmers who exist between the very small farmers who are selling direct and the very large farmers who can only make do on volume. But what about the eater of the middle? What about our friends and neighbors who don't have time or means or interest to cook from scratch and eat? It's estimated that the share of food in this country that's defined as good meaning local or humanely raised or organic or meeting some other sort of sustainability or eco-certification is just 5% of our food supply. Just 5%. As small as that number may be, it also means that there's plenty of low-hanging fruit that remains. And when supermarkets and fast food joints and corporate cafeterias start catching on, things will really snowball. Just last week, to mention another example from my area, I heard that the Bay Shore School District, one of the largest on Long Island, is using thousands of pounds of B-sized mini potatoes in its cafeteria. Long Island-grown B-sized mini potatoes. These are the little spuds that used to be used to make knishes and for other processing purposes, but they're actually perfect for roasting, whole, unpeeled, and then, uh, and then served, uh, gobbled up by school children, probably with the aid of ketchup. <laughs> In this case, the farmers didn't have to do anything differently. It was instead a school food service administrator, shown here with that puzzled look on her face, not believing that small potatoes could have anything good to offer her. Um, <laughs> She wondered how she could make better use of a product that already existed in her supplier catalog that was cheaper than the bigger potatoes but didn't have a local market. Picked up by other schools on Long Island, this could be the first major new market for Long Island potatoes in generations. Everywhere you look, not just in Happy Valley and beyond, everywhere you look are examples of good food moving beyond the fringe. And I suspect that each of us in this room can point to similar examples in their own community. So let me do a quick exercise to see if this is true. Raise your hand if a hospital or a government cafeteria or other big institution in your area is starting to buy local produce. Raise your hand if there is a seed bank or seed saving effort in your area or a focus on heritage breeds. Raise your hand if a school or school district in your area has planted an edible schoolyard or launched some other farm-to-school program. The really exciting thing is these efforts are already spreading without the support of government or other big institutions. Instead, they are propelled by folks just like us, farmers, parents, community leaders, concerned eaters, all working together. With that said, let me end by asking you to consider something. As you scroll through seed catalogs, tune up your planters, and otherwise plan your business goals for the coming year, as you take the knowledge and information that you've gleaned here in the classroom and chatting around the water fountain, think about this. How can you make a change in your business or in concert with others in your industry this year to not just entice more people to share the burden but to help your business thrive. Look, we're, we're all busy people. We're not necessarily looking for new things to add to our lives, but some of these things are relatively easy to do. The Bayshore administrator who started buying B-sized potatoes said the move actually saved her money. And she said to me the answer was lurking all along right under her nose. As a bonus, her purchase of those mini potatoes helps revive our economies, 
protects our landscape, nourishes our children, and enriches our communities. And that's the most important work that any of us can do. Thank you.